What do you bring into lab this week? <coughs> Laptops, and it would also be helpful, and maybe I should have emphasized this yesterday, because for those of you today, it's a little bit late. If you review action potential and membrane potential stuff, help you get through the lab better. If you at least have some idea, rather than if you just came to class but have never reviewed your notes. Okay, so be helpful if you're up to speed on those things. Okay, yesterday we ended talking about the different parts of a neuron. We talked about the soma or cell body. These little projections are the dendrites. These are where synapses occur. This is where information is received from another neuron. And then an impulse will travel down the axon and down here at these synaptic terminals. This neuron will release a neurotransmitter and activate the next cell here, the postsynaptic cell. I forgot to mention yesterday an important region of this neuron, and that's this little area between the dotted lines right here, the axon hillock. <clears throat> we'll talk about that a little more later, but while we're on this picture of the neuron, I just want to mention that when this neuron receives information through its dendrites, <clears throat> it's the axon hillock region here that sums that information. What that means is that if we get up to minus 55 millivolts, why is minus, why is minus 55 important? Threshold. threshold. What happens at threshold? Action potential Y. What's magic about minus 55 millivolts? You got it. It opens the sodium activation gates. So the sodium channels open there, okay? So if we get up to minus 55 right here at the axon hillock, we'll get an action potential that will move on down the axon. If we don't get up to threshold here at the axon hillock, we won't get any signal that moves on. So the axon hillock is an important region that sums all the different inputs that are coming from all these different dendrites. You could have hundreds or even a thousand different neurons all impinging on this guy right here, all giving information. Some of it could be inhibitory, some of it excitatory. So it's the axon hillock region that sums that information, decides whether we're going to get an action potential moving on or whether we're not going to have that. Okay. Next, given that all the organelles are up here in the cell body, but we need proteins and we need neurotransmitter and we need things like that down here, and given that this axon could be as long as a meter in length in your longest neurons, how do we get all those things? Remember our protein synthesis unit? We've got the ER, we've got ribosomes and so on. How are we going to get those things that are made up here, down here? Okay. And so on your handout, notice there's two headings down below, axoplasmic flow and axonal transport. And so that's what those headings refer to. How are we going to move things like proteins, from the soma, from the cell body, down the axon to the synaptic terminals. Axoplasmic flow is bulk flow, if you will. The cytoplasm, the fluid inside the cell, is gradually moving from this end, the cell body end, the soma end, towards the synaptic terminals. And as it gradually moves, it carries things that are in the cytoplasm with it. Just like if you threw a stick in the ocean, it would eventually wash up on shore. Okay, bulk flow. It's just moving along with the fluid. That's a pretty slow process. Probably, I don't know, something like an average speed is about two millimeters a day. How long is it going to take to move a meter at two millimeters a day? <coughs> 
long time. Anybody can throw a number out and actually do math in their head anymore in this generation? It's, it's not that hard. How many millimeters are in a meter? A thousand. So at two millimeters a day, how many days is that? That's a year and a half. <coughs> is that a good rate? Is that a helpful rate for your body? Well, it is on some cases, okay? And it might be a little bit faster than that, but it's a long time is the point. It takes a long, long time. Okay? So axoplasmic flow is slow. Axonal transport uses a different mechanism. It uses microtubules. Microtubules provide a network along which we can move proteins and other things that have to move. There are contractile proteins all along these microtubules, and they contract and move things along. You can think about this a little bit like a conveyor belt. Okay? So would you rather throw your stick in the ocean and wait for it to come to shore, or would you rather run a conveyor belt to shore and put things on the conveyor belt, which would be faster? The conveyor belt would be quite a bit faster, right? And you move things, oh, maybe an average of 400 millimeters a day. So we can move things in your longest neurons, even in your very longest ones, in a couple of days or close to that. So axoplasmic flow and axonal transport are both ways that we move things. By the way, axonal transport can move things in both directions. can move things from the cell body out to the terminals and from the terminals back to the cell body, whereas axoplasmic flow is one directional. Okay, now we want to move on to what this unit is really about, and that is how do we get signal from one cell to another? How do we get signal across a synapse? There are two types of synapses, or two types of connections between cells. And let me just mention those two types before I move on to talking about one of them. So before we get to this figure, the two types are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. Chemical synapses are slower last longer and are one way in the way they move information. They can only move information in one direction. Okay, so that's chemical synapses. Slower, longer lasting, move information in only one direction. Electrical synapses are faster and can move information in either direction. And we'll talk about both types, and that will become more plain to you in a minute, or a few minutes. So this figure that you have <coughs> is about a chemical synapse. And chemical synapses use neurotransmitters. They're going to release a chemical from one cell. It's going to diffuse across a synaptic gap or a synaptic cleft, the space between the two cells. It's going to bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic cell and do something there to activate that cell. So it uses a chemical. That's why it's called a chemical synapse. The chemicals are neurotransmitters. If you've got your hand out there, notice that I've listed um, three different very common neurotransmitters. These are ones that we'll talk about in this class quite a bit. The first one is acetylcholine. Where is acetylcholine a neurotransmitter? Zena? <laughs> That's not a bad guess. Now the, the choline is refers to chemical structure, not to a body part. Okay. How many of you have the handout? Is there, is there a few people who don't have it? Raise your hand if you don't have it. Uh, so, acetylcholine is the first one I'm talking about. 
you can forever after abbreviate it as ACH, capital A, capital C, little h. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that makes your muscles move. Your motor nerves release acetylcholine, release ACH, to activate skeletal muscle. We'll also talk about it some other places as we move on. Okay. Then the other two neurotransmitters both fall under the class of catecholamines, the two that I want to mention. One of those is epinephrine. The other one is nor epinephrine. Anybody in here allergic to bee stings? Anybody carry an epi kit? Okay. So that's what you're carrying right there. Okay, epinephrine. What's the other name that epinephrine goes by? And you all know the other name, whether you know it or not right now. Adrenaline, yeah. Okay, so the British call these adrenaline and noradrenaline. You've all heard about something that gets your adrenaline going or something like that. Okay, so epinephrine is the same as adrenaline. So we'll talk about these neurotransmitters, specific cases in which they're used quite a bit throughout the semester because they're used a lot in control of different organ systems. Um, when we get to start organ systems in a couple of weeks or so, a lot of the control is, is part of these different guys. Okay, so let's go through this figure. How does this happen? What's exactly going on in a chemical synapse? I gave you a brief summary, a rough summary. Let me set this picture up. So here we have an axon terminal or a synaptic terminal. Okay, this is the far end of that neuron that we had in the previous figure. Here's the synaptic cleft. This area in gray right here, this is the gap between the presynaptic cell, the neuron in this case, and the postsynaptic cell, whatever this is, muscle or another nerve or um, a cell in your colon or something like that. Okay. So we have to get a chemical that moves from here across to here. These little purple guys that look like, I don't know, sideways yo-yos or hamburgers or something. Those are meant to represent receptors and ion channels. We'll talk about those in a minute. Let's move back to our neuron. These guys that are here in green are called vesicles or synaptic vesicles. See that word right here on your figure? Synaptic vesicles. And they store neurotransmitter. If you look at the little dots that are sort of inside of there, that's meant to represent little molecules of neurotransmitter. So that's what has to get released out of the cell and is going to diffuse across and bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic cell. Now how does that happen? Notice the arrow here. We have a nerve impulse. What's the word we've been using for nerve impulse? What is that? It's an action potential. Okay. So we have an action potential moving down the axon from the other end of this neuron, from the soma end, and it gets out here, and it opens voltage-operated calcium channels. Voltage-operated channels. Let's actually, let's do another definition right here. Because we're going to talk about two different types of channels today. Voltage-operated channels... Sometimes we just say VOX or VOCs for short. And receptor operated channels. A voltage operated channel is one that gets opened when the membrane reaches a certain voltage. For example, the sodium channels that we've talked about already in regard to action potentials. When the membrane reaches a certain voltage, that channel opens. A receptor operated channel is one that opens when some agent like a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor that's attached to that channel. So it's turned on or it's opened 
when something binds to its receptor. Okay, so voltage operated channels and receptor operated channels. The channels that we have right here, these calcium channels, see here at number one, okay, the action potential is moving down this axon and these channels are voltage operated calcium channels. Calcium happens to be, I don't think we've talked about this yet, but calcium concentrations are much higher outside the cell than inside the cell. Concentrations are pretty low in the cytoplasm. So if you open a calcium channel, which way will calcium move? It will move in. And you see the arrow there showing you calcium moving in. Calcium is a common signaling messenger in cells. Very common signaling messenger. I had a friend in graduate school. He said, if you don't know the answer to a question, just put calcium down. And you have a pretty good chance of getting it right. Okay, it's a really common signaling messenger. In this case, this calcium going into the cell is activating these vesicles. We don't understand exactly how this happens, but calcium is a signal that causes the vesicles to move to the membrane. Your book probably says translocate. That just means move. Okay, going to move to the membrane, move to a different spot. Vesicles are made out of membrane. Ves vesicles are a phospholipid bilayer, just like cell membranes are. So when they get to the membrane, they fuse with the membrane, and that means they open up. So they move to the membrane, they fuse, and they open up, and what happens to the neurotransmitter that's inside? It gets released, it gets dumped out into the cleft. What do we call that when a cell releases something? Exocytosis, exactly right, okay? So this is an example of exocytosis. So the action potential opens calcium channels, calcium moves in and activates vesicles to move, and now we've got neurotransmitter release. Where does that neurotransmitter go? The laws of diffusion would say what? Everywhere the concentration is lower, right? Which means basically away from this membrane and towards this membrane. And when it moves across, this distance is probably only a couple of microns. Anybody know what a micron is? A micron is one one thousandth of a millimeter, okay, or one millionth of a meter. So it's a very short distance, very small distance for diffusion here. And it binds to a receptor. This little box right here around this receptor channel is meant to take you over to here, to this side. So notice that we've got a receptor. <coughs> And when that receptor is bound by a neurotransmitter, it opens a channel. In the example shown to you here, the channel is a specific sodium channel. If we open a sodium channel, which way will sodium move? In. What happens to the inside of that membrane? Becomes more positive. Okay. Remember talking about graded potentials? That's exactly what's going on here. This is causing a graded potential as sodium moves in through this, what kind of channel? Receptor operated channel. Because the neurotransmitter bound to receptor and opened this channel. Sodium moved in and the membrane is getting closer to threshold. If it gets all the way to threshold, then we get an action potential. You got it, okay? Neurotransmitters get degraded fairly rapidly. So notice over here in this box, the neurotransmitter is being broken down. That channel closes again, and we no longer have a signal. Is that a good thing? You want that signal to end? Okay. Could I walk around like I'm doing right now if muscles weren't relaxing really rapidly as well? So if ACH stayed bound to its receptor, 
that muscle would stay contracted and I couldn't walk around or do most of the things that we do in the course of a day, right? Or in the course of athletic events or whatever. For acetylcholine, I'll just mention this right now, we'll talk a little bit later about the catecholamines. For acetylcholine, there's a chemical called acetylcholine esterase. So just write acetylcholine and add esterase, often abbreviated ACHase. The ending ACE tells you what? It's an enzyme, and in this case it's an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. It's a common enzyme located all over your body, in your blood and in synapses. So, and it works really rapidly. Acetylcholine is broken down really rapidly. <coughs> okay, so that's a simple step-by-step -step process. Action potential comes down the nerve, opens voltage-operated calcium channels, calcium diffuses in, activates vesicle movement, vesicles move to the membrane and neurotransmitter gets released, neurotransmitter binds to receptors, receptors open channels, and in this case we have sodium moving in, we have excitation in the postsynaptic cell. What if instead of a sodium channel this were a potassium channel? Potassium would be moving out, Zena says. You guys all think that's right? You should, because it is right. So what would happen to the postsynaptic membrane in that case? If positive charges are moving out, what's going to happen to the inside? Become more negative. Do you think that's excitatory or inhibitory in this case? It's inhibitory. We're moving further away from threshold. So if this were a potassium channel, which it often is, okay, then rather than activating the postsynaptic cell, you would be inhibiting that postsynaptic cell. A third type of channel that is sometimes activated by neurotransmitter is a chloride channel. Chloride concentrations are much higher outside the cell than inside. Chloride's much higher outside than inside. So if you open a chloride channel, which way will chloride move? And what charge does chloride carry? It's a negative, a single negative. So if chloride's moving in, what's happening to the inside of the membrane? It's also becoming more negative, okay? So potassium and chloride channels will both cause inhibition rather than excitation. Sodium channels opening will cause excitation. So let's move on to this figure. On the far left, the left hand one of these two figures, okay. which kind of channel do you think opened right here? A sodium channel. And that, see that term EPSP? It stands for excitatory postsynaptic potential. Excitatory postsynaptic potential. It's a graded potential. It's a type of graded potential. What does graded mean? It means that it has no threshold. It means that unlike action potentials, they can be added or subtracted from each other. For example, if I hit it again right here, we've got a later figure, we could add to this. And it means that they die away rapidly again, too, if they don't reach threshold, unlike action potentials. They die away rapidly if they don't reach threshold. This dotted line is meant to represent threshold, as it says right there. Over here, this could have been a potassium channel or a chloride channel. What do you think the IPSP stands for? Inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Okay. 
inhibitory postsynaptic potential, or IPSP. Notice that this moved us further away from threshold. And so we're going to be less likely to have an action potential occur as a result of this event. This next figure is just meant to show you different types of summation of graded potentials. Okay. So notice here we have the cell body, we have the dendrites. Okay. What, what do these little white things represent? Myelin, you got it. So the axon hillock would be right here before the first myelin section. Okay, right in that space between the cell body and the axon. And here we have a neuron, so we have a synapse happening here, and we hit it, it's excitatory in this case. It didn't reach threshold, so it dies out again. We hit it again, it didn't reach threshold, it dies out again. Okay, that's the property of a graded potential. In panel B, we have what's labeled on your figure as temporal summation. What does the word temporal refer to? Not just a science word. Okay, time. Temporal refers to time. So here we have, again, a single neuron. But notice where the two stimuli occur. Okay. We had a stimulus that opened sodium channels and we get some excitation. And now, close in time, before this graded potential dies out, it was stimulated again. They add together, they consume because these are graded potentials. And when that happened, it got above threshold and now we got an action potential. Spatial summation just refers to two different stimuli occurring close together in space on the, on the cell body, on the membrane. Temporal refers to time, spatial refers to space, or how close they are together. The last panel, D, shows that IPSPs can cancel EPSPs. You hit it with an excitatory potential but also an inhibitory one at the same time, and they basically cancel out. So they can add or they can subtract. Now this is a very simple way of showing you. <clears throat> Remember, there can be hundreds of inputs coming to these dendrites on this cell body. Okay? The summation, the integration, is going to occur at the axon hillock region. So if you have <clears throat> A neuron that synapses right here, see where my little cursor is? And you have a neuron that synapses out here, which one's going to have more influence? Yeah, the closer one, because it's less likely to die out before it gets to the axon hillock as it travels along the membrane. Okay. So what determines whether this neuron is going to fire an action potential or not in the end is this different types of summation. That's how it gets integrated at the axon hillock in the end. Justin, question? Yeah, so action potentials and graded potentials both have a threshold and negative. Graded potentials don't have a threshold. They'll turn into an action potential or they will cause an action potential if they get up to minus 55. Okay? But as soon as we open sodium channels, for example, positive charges moving in, the membrane potential will start to go up. That's a graded potential at that point. Okay? That happens because of receptor-operated channels. If we get up to minus 55, we open the activation gates of the voltage-operated channels, and now we have an action potential. Right. So in the end, under normal physiological conditions, both types of channels, the ROCs and the VOX, are going to contribute to signaling.
Okay, this is just, <clears throat> you've got a flow chart, and you've got a table. Okay, this review, if you didn't like the picture, probably most of you like the picture, but physiology uses a lot of flow charts. By the way, making your own flow charts is a great way to study physiology, because if you can draw this out, and you can say, okay, this happens, and then it causes this, and then it causes this, to me, that's much better than making flashcards or things like that and trying to memorize as far as studying processes, as far as studying function and physiology. Okay, So I don't need to go through this right now, but this is a flowchart that does the same um, things that we've just talked about. Okay. And you also have a table that looks like this. Notice that it compares action potentials to the two types of graded potentials, either excitatory, EPSPs, or inhibitory, IPSPs. Okay. Notice, these guys will go long distance, action potentials. These guys will only go short distance. Spreads to the axon hillock. Okay. What's the stimulus for opening? Well, an action potential requires voltage operated channels. But the two types of graded potentials are open by neurotransmitter binding to receptors. <clears throat> so they're receptor operated. Okay, and so I'll let you go on through that table. It reviews. Notice one other thing at the bottom, I should point this out. There are no refractory periods for graded potentials. And that's what allows them to be added together or subtracted from each other. The fact that they have no refractory periods. That allows them to be summed added or subtracted. Okay, that is what I wanted to say about chemical potentials, I think. I'm just looking to make sure I didn't forget anything here. <clears throat> Next, we want to talk about electrical synapses. In an electrical synapse, we actually have a channel between the two cells. So let me, this might look like a weird picture to you. But up at the top up here is the inside of one cell, and this is the cell membrane of that cell. Here's the gap, right in the middle here is the gap between the two cells. And then here's another cell membrane, and down here is the cytoplasm of that second cell. So see up top here it says presynaptic cytoplasm, here it says postsynaptic cytoplasm. Okay. Notice here it says the distance is only three and a half nanometers. What's a nanometer? That's a thousandth of a micron, or it's 10 to the minus ninth meters, okay? For those of you who haven't had chemistry, if you had chemistry, you should remember those things. What's the next smallest one after nano? Pico, what's next after that? 10 to the minus 15th is femto. <laughs> Okay, useless trivia. <laughs> Not useless. But. <laughs> okay. um, but a lot of things get measured in nano in the body, both distances and concentrations. Okay. For example, calcium concentration, you don't have to write this down, but calcium concentrations inside your cell, remember I said they were pretty low? They're in the nanomolar range. Okay, so that's really, really low, unless we have a channel opening and calcium moving in. So. All right, so here's the channel that connects these two cells. This channel is called a gap junction. A gap junction. We have a gap junction channel that connects these two cells. That means there's a direct connection between the cytoplasm of one cell and the cytoplasm of another cell. We opened up a channel between those two cells. <clears throat> 
Now, rather than releasing a chemical that has to diffuse across, bind a receptor, open a receptor, let sodium diffuse in, or something like that, we can just move sodium straight through these channels, for example. We can move electrical impulses, action potentials, right straight through this channel. Now, do you see why this kind of synapse is faster? Okay, because every one of those events in a chemical synapse takes time. It might only be part of a millisecond, but it takes time. It takes time to open a calcium channel, for calcium to move in, for the vesicles to diffuse to the membrane, to release the neurotransmitter, for that to diffuse. All those things take time. So this is faster. It's also usually bidirectional. We can move things in either direction through these channels. These channels are made of proteins called connexins. You like the way scientists name things? Something connects two cells, which, what are we going to call that protein? Gap junctions are made of proteins called connexins. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail on this. But see that each one of these parts here, each one of these channels, if you look here, has six parts. Okay? And the other cell down here also has six parts. So each cell makes half of a channel with six connections that come together. And then the two channels, the two cells come together, and now you've got a whole channel. So that whole channel all together is made of 12 connection proteins. Don't write down any more about this, just briefly let me tell you, there are a number of different kinds of connection proteins. And we're just starting to learn about this stuff. We don't know a lot about it yet, but the properties of that channel probably depend on which kinds of connections are in there. It looks like these channels can be gated, so sometimes they're open, sometimes not open. There's a lot of fairly complex stuff that can happen here that um, we're just kind of starting to learn about. Okay. So that is an electrical synapse. This figure that you have compares the two. Okay. Here we have gap junction channels. Notice this. So this is obviously an electrical synapse. Okay. And over here we have neurotransmitter being released. And so that's a chemical synapse. So I'll let you, that's review, we've covered both of these concepts now, and I'll let you take a look at that figure as a way of comparing the two and reviewing what's going on there. Any questions about synapses, either type of synapse, or their properties? Go ahead, Jasmine. Individual gap junctions that I know of don't change in size, but there are different <coughs> size channels. Yeah, okay. For example, one way to study them is to try and put dyes in one cell, use a microelectrode to put a dye in a cell, and then see if it goes through into a neighboring cell, because supposedly it should move through that direct connection. But whether it moves or not depends on the molecular weight of your dye, how big the molecules in your dye are. So if you put in a dye, really small molecules that can move, little bigger molecules often don't. Okay. So it's going to take, that's a good point, because it's going to take relatively small signaling molecules to move through these channels. Large signaling molecules won't go. For those of you who have had, those of you who have not had cell bio, don't worry about it, but those of you who have had or have had biochemistry, are you familiar with a molecule called IP3, Nastal triphosphate? Do I get any nods of recognition at all in here? Okay, then forget it anyways. That's a common signaling messenger too. Small one that can move as well. Connor? So the ions that flow through the gap junction channels, what is like, I thought it was just the electrical current. What's a, what is electrical current? It's, like it's movement of charge. What's carrying the charge? 
I'm not sure what you mean. Like in the last chapter when it talks about the action potential. Yep. Well, does the action potential move, or is it charge that moves? It's charge that moves, causing an event that we call the action potential. Okay, so what's that? <clears throat> well, what's moving in an action potential? What causes the charge to move? Isn't it sodium and potassium? Isn't that what's moving charge? Yeah. Okay, so same thing here. If we're moving ions, an ion just means charged particle. So if we're moving sodium or if we're moving calcium, those things carry charge, right? Oh, okay. So that's, that's how we move electrical activity, by moving something like sodium through those channels. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Is it useful to be able to inhibit action potentials? Yes. I got a yes somewhere. Justin, was that you? <laughs> Why, anybody? Yeah, anybody in here ever heard of the cross extensor reflux? Probably not. Those of you sports medicine majors, you'll get to it with Priscilla eventually. I'm walking along in my bare feet, and I step on a tack. Okay? What's my immediate reaction? To withdraw. Okay? What does that mean? It means I'm activating flexor muscles. But what do I also have to inhibit at the same time to allow that to happen? Extensor muscles, right? You guys all know flexion and extension. If you've had anatomy, I sure hope you do. Okay? So flexion, extension. Do I want to extend that leg? That'll just make it hurt a lot worse, right? So I want to activate flexor muscles, but at the same time, I want to inhibit extensor muscles. Now, I said it's a crossed extensor reflex. What about the other leg? Do you want to activate flexors in the other leg, too? Because what will happen then? You'll land on your butt on the tack, right? Okay. So in the other leg, you want to activate extensors so that you stay standing and inhibit flexors. Okay. So just a simple example, because students sometimes wonder, well, why would you want to have inhibitory potentials? Why would you want to have IPSPs anyways? Okay. So there's lots of cases in which that's useful in your body to do. Okay. So that's... A quick trip through synapses. Any questions on what we covered in there? Well, then maybe that cross extensor reflex is a good transition to skeletal muscle because we were just talking about muscles. Here's our. Uh, anybody recognize this guy? Our. Uh, our recently um, disgraced governor of California in his younger days, steroid-induced days. Okay, so there's a lot of muscle. Before we move into the figures you have, just let me remind you that there are three types of muscle. This unit will be about skeletal muscle. We'll cover the other two types later. Skeletal muscle is striated. What does that word mean? Striped. Striped, yeah. If you look at it under a high-power microscope, you'll see little stripes. When you eat a steak, do you see stripes in it? Steak is muscle, by the way. Okay. So there's the chicken you eat, the fish you eat, all the meats you eat are muscle. Skeletal muscle. Okay. Now, you need a high-power microscope to see those stripes, and it has to do with... Um, the way the cells are organized, and we'll get on to that. We'll talk about that. Skeletal muscle is also voluntary. Okay. You decide whether to move it or not. Anybody know any exceptions to that? Breathing muscle is skeletal muscle. Your diaphragm, for example. Okay. So you don't think about activating that. But you can still overcome. I can hold my breath, or I can breathe harder, for example. So for a little while, you can voluntarily activate those muscles or inhibit those muscles, too. So in general, skeletal muscle is voluntary. Cardiac muscle is the muscle in your heart. 
it's striated. That means that it's when we talk about how it's organized, it's going to be very similar to skeletal muscle because it also has that striped appearance under a high power microscope. Fortunately for you, it's involuntary. Otherwise, you might not want to go to sleep, right? Okay. It's involuntary. It contracts automatically. In fact, I'll talk about this when we get to the cardiac muscle section. But you can take individual cardiac muscle cells out of an animal like a guinea pig or something in an experiment, take out the heart, enzymatically disperse those cells, look at a single cell under a microscope, and you can see it sitting there going all by itself. Okay? So they're involuntary. They contract automatically, if you will. Smooth muscle is in most of the hollow organs of your body. So your digestive tract, your blood vessels, your airways, your urinary tract, your bladder, reproductive tract, all those different systems have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is not striped. That's why we call it smooth. So it's, as we find out when we get there, it's organized differently. It has a different structure at the cell level. It's also involuntary. You don't think about contracting the muscle in the walls of your blood vessels, for example, or in your intestines. Okay, it's involuntary. So we'll talk about all of these, but this unit is about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the muscle that produces movement. Almost all, not there's one or two exceptions, but almost all skeletal muscle is attached to a bone on either end. Attached, one end attaches to one bone, the other end attaches to a different bone. Skeletal muscle always works by shortening. When it shortens, it's going to pull those two bones closer together. So if I have a muscle that attaches right here on my forearm and its other end attaches up here, what's going to happen when that muscle shortens? It's going to pull these two bones closer together and now we have movement around a joint. Okay, we produced movement around a joint when that muscle shortened. This figure shows you muscle organization. Okay. A whole muscle is wrapped in a connective tissue sheath called the epimyceum. See that word right here in the figure? It's a connective tissue sheath that wraps around the whole muscle. Within that whole muscle, we have bundles of fibers okay, that are called fascicles. A whole bundle of muscle fibers is called a fascicle. And the fascicle is wrapped in a connective tissue sheath called the paramyceum. By the way, some people say these epimyceum, paramyceum. Okay, I prefer the myceum. It sounds less like a cellular organelle you'd see under a microscope that way. And within a fascicle, you have muscle fibers. Notice in parentheses here it says that a muscle fiber is the same as the muscle cell. And each of those muscle fibers has a connective tissue layer called the endomyceum, the endomyceum around each muscle fiber. Notice that we also, on the ends, have a connective tissue area called the tendon. The tendon makes that connection between the bone and the muscle. Tendon is not going to contract, but it's going to pull on that bone when the muscle contracts. So in a rough sense, that's the organization. Muscle fibers or muscle cells are organized into motor units. We talked about this briefly in lab last week because we talked about receptors being organized into sensory units. A motor unit is a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. What's that word innervate mean? Mm 
It means a nerve connects to it. Innervate. A nerve connects. So a motor unit is a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it connects to or all the muscle fibers that it innervates. Motor units come in different sizes. They can be only a very few muscle fibers. They can be 2,000 muscle fibers on the large end. So they come in different sizes from just a few up to 2,000 muscle fibers. The smaller motor units have a lower threshold of activation. That means they get activated more easily. Smaller motor units get activated more easily than larger motor units. You think that's a good idea? You guys, most of you are writing right now. Would you like to activate small motor units or really large ones? Would you like to produce a lot of force or just light force? Okay. And the more and more force you need, the more motor units you recruit. There comes that word again. We used recruitment before for something else too, didn't we? Right. The more force you need, the more motor units you recruit. Let me stop there. That's kind of in the middle of something, but we'll pick up there on Thursday. And I will see a bunch of you in lab this afternoon at 2.